Welcome for tuning in to In the Know with the Bullionette. I'm Dawn Marie, a Silver Level Associate and Top Recruiter at 7K. Join me in welcoming this fabulous Tuesday, my special return guest, A.G. Leveraged, a fan of history, economics, and politics, and he's here to give us some great information on 401Ks. So, A.G., welcome to the show. Hi there, Dawn. How are you today? I'm awesome. Happy Tuesday to you. So Thank let's you. elaborate a little bit on 401ks. What exactly happens when, a, when people try to take money out of their 401k or pension or deferred compensation? So Don, I'd like to first uh, clarify that uh, neither myself nor yourself are financial planners, nor are we financial advisors. And if someone wants professional information uh, as such, they should go to their licensed financial plan and advisor. We are simply here on this program giving our opinions on the matter. So your question regarding 401ks. So all this time we've been, as Americans, saving through two manners. We've either bought a home and took 30 years to pay it off, and then what the home is worth after 30 years, there is a form of savings. And then the second form of savings was, well, it was the pension program from which the 401k has stemmed from. Uh, the 401k is the second uh, manner in which we now save. And up until now, we've been told, contribute into your 401k or your pension or, or deferred comp, whatever the company it is that you that a person works for offers. And we've been told to maximize that contribution on a weekly, biweekly, monthly basis as much as possible so that we're secured when later on when we're, when we're going to retire, especially when a company will match whatever our contribution into our retirement is. And so that's what the majority of people have done. The problem with that equation is that once a person gets to retirement age, uh, and let's say they've been working at their work for 30 years and they're now in their mid-50s and they're ready to retire or their 60s or whatever they may be, um, they've been told by by their company a certain amount that they're going to be receiving every month. What's happening time and again nowadays is that, dollar amount doesn't turn out to be what they were promised. Almost immediately, they're renegotiated to a lesser amount, and they're told that uh, there's just a lot of people retiring at the same time, and in order to meet everyone's needs, this is what needs to happen. So that's the first thing. The second thing that occurs is when that person decides to take money from their own savings, from their own 401k, they want to take out a a big chunk. after fees, penalties, commissions, and taxes, they could easily face up to a 40% hit if they want to take a big chunk out, if not all of it. And so instead, what usually they're advised is that they take a loan out against their own money that they then pay back with interest. Now, we usually don't sit back and think about that, but we're actually borrowing money from ourselves and paying interest back into a loan from our own savings. And so when you break it down in that manner, it just seems unfound. It seems like so why, why would it? Why, yeah, why would a person ever have to pay an interest on a loan from money from their own retirement fund? That's crazy. And we don't stop and actually question that. Instead, we do what everyone at our perimeter does. We do what our society tells us. We do what our what everyone who's retired within our own companies tells us, which is contribute to the maximum, so later on you're going to be good. So we'll get that monthly check, but again, should we for whatever reason, maybe someone in our family needs help, uh, one of our sons or daughters, maybe one of our parents do, maybe there's a medical emergency, maybe there's some opportunity where we want to use a big chunk of monies and we believe we have it, and suddenly we want access to it, then for the first time we realize, do we have access to our own money? And for this reason, you and I have spoken a few times about how it's important to, to hold some of that portfolio in the form of precious metals and in the form of our own possession. And, and so that's where it's at, gold and silver, correct, Don? Absolutely. You know, you, you bury it under the apple tree, you put it where you need to put it in your possession, and you're not paying any interest on that loan. 
right? And you can use it as collateral. That's an added plus that a lot of people don't realize, that having silver and gold is a collateral. So for those that don't have the best credit or their FICA score might be a little uh, low, then consider that as well. Most people will take uh, collateral. Go ahead. What, what a brilliant point, Don. So it is, in fact, an asset. It's not just a currency. So if I, if I hoard cash... It, it is it is a currency, but it, but it's it's not backed by anything. If I want to make a big purchase, I need to be able to demonstrate that I have a set amount of cash in the bank in order to make a big purchase. If I hold it in the form of gold and silver, that actually becomes a physical asset that backs any any uh, purchase that I want to make. So that's a very valid point that you're bringing up, Don, and a good one. That uh, and, saving, oh yes, saving in gold and silver works not just as a, as a form of, of currency savings, but also as a hard asset which backs the purchase of any potential uh, buy in the future. And there's something magical about um, stashing away some silver and gold. You know, when you stash away cash, you get into the cash, and it's usually that shoebox gets emptied pretty quickly. But there's something different about gold and silver, uh, at least in my personal experience. Uh, I have not been an avid saver of cash throughout my life, and that's always been something that's perplexed me. But the gold and silver, it's a little different, and uh, I think that everyone will find the same thing to be to hold true for them. So, all right, well, let's get back to the question. Um, the next one I'd like to offer is what about CDs and mutual funds? Do you consider those to be safe? CDs are certificates of deposit. That's where the bank says, if you store your money in my, ma in my management, in my bank, under my management, I will pay you this interest rate for a set amount of time. And CDs can vary in time from a year or two to, to 10 to 20 to 25 years as long as, as, as a person believes that that's their, their form of retirement. The problem with those CDs is that today they're paying 1%, 1.5%, maximum 2%, and it's got to be a very large amount of money that a person locks away for a long period of time. So even after, let's say, 20, 25 years, when a person takes out a, a big, a, a, say, say a $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 deposit, they're only going to get back a very, very small difference and inflation would normally have beat out whatever that interest rate is in return. We've, we've, we've mentioned before how at this moment the banks need fluidity, and the central banks are being injected with cash, and they in turn are doing the same to private banks. So if we're already familiar that the banks are already short of liquid, why would we want to consider putting our money into a CD in a bank that at this point is illiquid to begin with? Regarding mutual funds, um, mutual funds have always been something that there's a lot of advisors who, who, who suggest towards uh, mutual funds, and they vary uh, from high risk to medium risk to low risk. Uh, but these mutual funds are nevertheless all invested in our stock market and in companies. And, and as we've spoken in previous videos, a lot of the companies today that those mutual funds are invested into, be they Tesla, AT&T, General Electric, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Ford, uh, General Motors, etc. A lot of these companies are, have, have enormous debt, and they themselves would be insolvent were it not for the low interest loans that they have available to them. So investing, whether it's a CD or mutual fund, also at this moment is a uh, is, is something to do with great caution. We're, we're in a moment where money's being printed an enormous amount, and if we were to look at the time between the 1920s and uh, let's say the mid-40s, we saw that money was printed, <clears throat> and the people on the very top, the central bankers themselves, they went ahead and used it and let their 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 corporate buddies use it as well before it ever got down to the, to the little people. So they were sitting on mountains of cash that they used to purchase fine art and to purchase rare things and, and, and then maybe another castle and so forth. But the money never came down to the bottom of the people, and it created uh, massive divisivity. Uh, it, it created a fascist versus communist environment in society. And today, to some degree, we're seeing that already. We see it on our, on our media. There's a lot of conversations of socialism and and 
a lot of socialism that's turning into communism. For the first time in a very long time, an American flag or American pride is something that a lot of people are concerned about being able to voice. Um, so we're entering a moment like that where, again, the central banks are printing like mad. They're lending out to their, to their big corporate uh, cronies, so to speak, and they're using it. They're, they're doing what they have to do, and they're hoarding it. And when they hoard it and it disallows that money from coming down to the general public, there's this great divide that occurs in society between the haves, which is a shrinking population, and the have-nots, which is a growing population. So, Incredible. And would it be true, I've heard this theory that um, everything repeats, and basically what's happening is if enough time can transition between a last event and the, the, the next event, so several generations go by, then the generation that experienced it as when they transition or they pass away, then the next generation is not aware of that or it wasn't their experience. And so we can repeat this pattern. So most of the people that lived during the Depression and saw that happen are now gone. And so basically they can do the same kind of thing to us without us not the majority of people not even be uh, knowing of it. Would that be safe to say? That's absolutely correct, Don. Right now, I'm 50 years old, Don, and the majority of people who collect, hoard, or stack precious metals, however you want to term it, they tend to be older folks, folks who are mid-70s, mid-80s, and they've lived through rough times. They've seen war, whether it's in this country or in another country. They know... Uh, recession, they know depression, they know these things, and having experienced it, they are very uh, guarded with their monies, and, and they tend to hoard cash and or precious metals. So you're absolutely correct. After a few generations, we forget. Uh, these stories haven't been passed to us. We haven't lived it. You and I, for example, have not experienced any real uh, financial circumstances um, where where, where it's a uh, depression, let's say. Certainly we've gone through a recession, which was a bad circumstance for, for many of us. But a depression where, where nothing gets better year after year after year, we've yet to go through. We certainly have to, haven't gone through. Uh, certainly we've been in war, but not the quality of war that some of the older folks have experienced, where they've been in the, in the, in the country where, where the war is occurring. Um, there's a lot of things that we haven't experienced. Because of that, we've become rather complacent and, and very trust, trustful of our, of our government and our fiduciaries, of our attorneys, of our planners, of our accountants. And that's not to say that, that we shouldn't do that, but it is to say that it's in us to be responsible, to learn history, and to really play a smart game to guard ourselves and our families and understand that a lot of times planners will advise a particular stock or particular fund that may draw them a bigger commission than another one, which may be more favorable to us. And so that, that's not to misspeak against them, because they do have families, but it falls on each one of us to be responsible for ourselves and to understand where we are uh, in history and, and as a society. So yes, Don, you're correct. Older folks tend to understand uh, the importance of precious metals more so than the average person, for sure. And so the side effect of having a stable government, not government, stable economy, a great country like the United States to live in is normalcy biased. And so if we haven't seen that, then the younger generation or those, even ourselves that are in our 50s or early 50s, say, uh, think that everything's just going to remain the same. Like, you know, that, that 2008, that was a fluke, you know, that. It isn't going to get any worse than that. Those are just people that are, you know, saying the sky is falling kind of people. So what would you say to that? I would say that at this moment we are printing a lot of paper, a lot of fiat. I would, I would suggest to everyone to do the research on what happens or what's happened with every single fiat currency in the, in the history of mankind. It always has returned down to its intrinsic value, which is zero. Uh, the, the, the printing of money and the higher-ups sitting on it, if you look back at history, the royals, the kings used to print money and used to sit on these gigantic 
stacks of cash. But it's artificial because, as we've said before, the, the printing of fiat, whether it says a 1, a 5, a 10, a 20, or even recently a 100, used to cost the same to them uh, no matter what, how many digits or zeros are behind it. So when it isn't backed by gold, when there is no gold standard to back that currency, then there is what it's called a false economy because no one really understands the value of anything because it isn't backed on anything. It's just backed on, on, on monopoly money that's being printed. That may sound harsh, but that's the way we've been living for quite a while now, certainly since 2008 and 2009 when some massive printing since then that has taken place. So now we see all these things occurring at our perimeter, um, and, and it behooves us to understand them, to learn about them, not to become fearful of them, but just to prepare, to plan, and to take action. Well, the good news is we're going to talk more about that on tomorrow's segment. We've got slated, so exciting, exciting news on that. So, AG, in wrapping up this session, what would your tip of the day be? The tip of the day is seasons change. Every season comes. Uh, once upon a time, we prepare for winter probably a little more than we do now. We would plant, we would grab fruits and vegetables, we would make jams and jellies, we would, we would dehydrate them, we would freeze them, we would, we would keep them so that during the winter we'd have all that and we would prepare a little better than, than we prepare nowadays. I think that uh, the, the convenience of, of grocery stores, shelves that are full of, of, of foods and canned goods and so forth, um, all of this has, has made us a little bit soft. I suggest that uh, we learn to prepare a little more and we open up our skill sets as much as possible so that we're always ready and not fearful, but just, just prepared. It, it's, it's, it's so important to, to understand where we are in history and to always be ready, to enjoy the day and to love what we do, but to practice good habits to, to be ready. Well, I think that that are uh, words of wisdom for everyone to mull on today. <laughs> And in closing, we want to especially thank our show sponsor, SilverPreparedness.com. And when you visit that website, and we highly recommend you head over there right after the show, you're going to see some great information that's going to provide more clarity and answers to questions that I believe you've had in your subconscious, probably didn't think, uh, have an awareness to ask. And I think it's going to just all fall into place and make so much sense to you. So do head over to silverpreparedness.com. And AG and I have found that buying your silver and gold or converting your uh, fiat currency to silver and gold at the very best dealer direct pricing with no minimum, minimums is definitely the way to go. Plus, your added benefit is that if it feels like a fit to you, that AG Leverage and I will be your personal mentor to help you navigate the waters of seven gay metals to success. So that's a win-win-win scenario you're going to want to dive into. Most importantly, I want to thank AG so much for your time um, and your profound insights. And until our next segment, everyone, have a remarkable day being in the know. <laughs> 